point blank by the Taliban. I don't know why she survived. Just because she wanted to go to school. If a man can go, why can't a woman? And now changing the world. Who is Malala? I am Malala. The incredible journey of a peacemaker who made it from this. She lost her smile, her laughter. To this. Miracle? If you believe in miracles, yes. Finally able to share all the thoughts she had in the hospital when her voice was silenced. I have written like, who did this to me? Why? Who shot me? The little girl who just hours ago met the first family after igniting a worldwide rallying cry for change. Now it's my right to speak. We stand with Malala. Not for myself, but for those without voice can be heard. I am Malala. Kills me, makes me feel alive. Unbreakable. One girl changing the world. Here now, Diane Sawyer. Good evening, I'm Diane Sawyer, and tonight we hope you've gathered family and friends because you're about to meet a young woman who is changing the world. She's teaching everyone about courage and the unstoppable power of children who just want to learn and walk the path to their future. She's 16 years old, and she was shot in the head because of what she believes. And we want you to know some of what you'll see tonight is a harsh reality. But her book, I Am Malala, reminds us all that radiant strength can sometimes come from surprising places, like a distant valley in Pakistan, where there is a battle between dark and light. In ancient times, the Pashtu people had a proverb. A woman's place is in the home or in the grave. I come from a country which was created at midnight. Tonight, a tiny Pashtu girl may be the bravest person in the world. When I almost died, it was just after midday. A year ago, Malala Yousafzai shot in the head at point-blank range. And tonight, 16-year-old girl, a towering presence in the world. Lining up with her, millions of people, heads of state, all religion, adult, children, holding up their hands to say, I am Malala too. I am Malala. I am Malala. We are Malala. Cheering her at the United Nations when she promised that millions of girls who've been silenced will be heard. One child, one book, and one pen can change the world. For the world, so much conviction. Hello. It's startling when you actually meet her. She is, in fact, small, shy, childlike, eager to show me her magic tricks. This is it. Oh, I know another trick. And the ring is out. Are you double jointed? No. But you are double jointed. Why don't you no. practice? And she says, like most teens, once she was worried about how short she is and how difficult her hair. I used to be in the toilet for hours. Everything about my hair, oh, my hair killed me. But inside the school, girl, a gladiator trying to wake up the world that girls should get to live their dreams too. 80 plus. In some parts of the world, students are going to school every day. It's their normal life. But in other parts of the world, we are starving for education. But for us, it's like a precious gift. It's like a diamond. You wanted to be number one in your class. <laughs> Pretty competitive. Still, I want to be the number one. She was born with wild curiosity and a lot of questions. For instance, in her culture, why are women forbidden to leave home without a man, even if the male is just a little boy? I wouldn't go outside without any boy. My brother would go with me. If, if a man can go, why can't a woman? I can see no difference between them. And by her side, navigating his child toward her dreams, her father, a teacher who built her school from ground up, scavenging money, even sweeping the floors. I had a great passion for education. My father was a teacher, a great teacher, and I loved teaching. Her mother, traditional, refusing to be photographed, never learning to read. There are also two little boys in the family. But dad says he always knew this girl was filled with infinite possibility. When uh, I saw her for the first time, a very newborn child, and I looked into her eyes, 
I fell in love with her, believe me. I love her. I love her. Malala has said, you always said, Malala will be free as a bird. Where did this come from? I accepted her as an individual. As in my society, sons are accepted. The only difference I met that I accepted our daughter as an individual. And when he was a young father, he was excited. His country seemed to be on the way to a more open future. There'd been a female prime minister, Benazir Bhutto. There were new schools and universities being built every day. And then in 2009, the Taliban came out of the shadows. The radical fundamentalist men who first banned dancing, the movies, burned DVDs in the streets and decreed a death penalty for barbers and any sign of independence in a woman. Malala was 11 years old and watching. They would slaughter people and then the Taliban would say, like, this man had not long beard, this one had short, she was not wearing burqa, that woman was a dancer, she's a singer, that's why we slaughtered them. They broadcast this announcement on the radio. All schools for girls had to be closed immediately. They bombed the schoolhouses, threw acid at the face of girl students, everyone in terror. Yet one little girl still had her powerful certainty that girls should not disappear into the silence. They cannot stop me. I will get my education if it is in home, school, or any place. What was the moment you were most afraid, that you had the most fear? Like, I was feeling fear all the time. I was worried that a Talib may come and he throw acid on my face. At night when I used to sleep, I was thinking all the time that, shall I put a knife under my pillow? She read her books in secret. 50,000 girls just like her in hiding too. So Malala Yosefzai decides to take a chance. These are my notebooks. She starts writing a diary using the name Gul Makai, Cornflower. With her father, they send it to the BBC. It is published online, reminiscent of another young girl in peril. Do you know about Anne Frank? Yes. She was a brave, confident girl who once lived. And I read a book about her, and she really amazed me. Why they are killed on the basis of religion? What's their, what's their crime? What have they done? Swat Willie! Next, Malala Swat speaks Willie! out in an online interview, one of her first calling on the world to help and using her name. We must have the confidence to say that this thing is going wrong and we must raise our voice. And that same year, the New York Times hears about her and begins filming this documentary of a shy, very brave young girl. I want to become, become a doctor. <laughs> The name Malala becomes a beacon out in the world, and in Pakistan, her words are gathering strength and supporters. So the Taliban send warning, death threats. Her father tries to navigate between hope and fear. But did you at any point say, did I let her become exposed and at risk? I agree, I agree. I think we should not put out the camera, okay? We value freedom. We live for a cause greater than our lives. He says the real question is, where was everyone else? The people who blame me, they should blame themselves who did not speak for their right. It was very hard, but you see, we stood to protect others. Later that year, at one point, it does seem better. Thanks to the Pakistan army, the Taliban forced to retreat. Ultimately, we will be the winner. And the miscreants, the militants, they will be the losers. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic. He's too much optimistic, so I don't agree with him because uh, the leaders, the commanders of Taliban are still alive. Still fearful, but with her childlike magical thinking, Malala rehearses how she would reason with her attacker if they still decide to come. It was always my desire before the attack that if a man comes, what would you tell him, Malala? I used to think like that. And I said that I would tell that man that education is very important. I would tell that man that I even want education for your daughter. And you think that would work against a gun? I thought that words and books and pens are more powerful than gun. On October 9th, 2012, she was on the little school bus, like this one still being used in Pakistan. The girls around her were singing. You were singing? 
Yes, and just uh, also like considering the bus to be a drum and making this music. A handful of girls, all of their faces covered. Only one was not. On the day when I was shot, all of my friends' faces were covered except mine. Was that wise? It was brave, but was it wise? At that time, I was not worried about myself. I wanted to live my life as I want. But the young girl did notice that the street was strangely quiet. I didn't see those men. I just could see, like, there is no one. Coming up, a man with a gun looking for just one girl on a bus, asking, who is Malala? I hide my face. More of Unbreakable, next. We continue now with Diane Sawyer and Malala. October 2012, in the remote and beautiful mountains of the Swat Valley of Pakistan. A group of schoolgirls are on their school bus singing. One of them notices that the road is strangely quiet. Where are the people? Suddenly, two men approach with beards and a gun, a Colt 45. One of them climbs on the bus and asks a question. Who is Malala? She doesn't remember what happened next, but her friend described that moment. She said, like, you said nothing, and you were just, for, you were just holding my hand, and you just squeezed my hand like you were just forcing it, and you said nothing. And she said, like, you just look at, looked at the men like this. Then she said, like, then he fired three, three bullets, and one hit you on the left side of my head. I would have been doing like this, so I hide my face because there was gunpowder on my fingers. A year later, her friend, still too afraid to go on camera, tells what happened next. My clothes, my shoes, my socks, my pouch, my books, all was just full of blood, Malala's blood. The girls are screaming as the little school bus frantically races to the bare bones local hospital. Their doctors only have basic first aid. We were trying our best. Two hours will pass before a helicopter can deliver her to a military surgeon who spends five hours trying to relieve the swelling on her brain and removing tiny clots. But already it's as if a kind of miracle is surrounding her. By a strange coincidence, there is someone in Pakistan for the first time. A top specialist in pediatric trauma from England, Dr. Fiona Reynolds, with her colleague, Dr. Javid Kayani. They've been sitting in long governmental meetings on medical programs when suddenly Dr. Reynolds is told to race out and try to save the life of a famous and dying child. The tubes have given Malala an infection. The machines are improperly set. Her blood isn't clotting. Her lungs and kidneys are beginning to fail. You thought she was dying? There was a possibility that she was dying, but there was also a possibility that she would survive. She had become septic. It was obvious that she had a very serious life-threatening infection. A distraught father asks, Is there any hope? And I said to him, well, the only reason I'm here is because there is some hope. And uh, he cried. Malala uh, is the most precious gift of God for me in this world. What would you have done if she had been lost? Don't say so. I should not lose her. I can't think of it. Dr. Reynolds makes a risky recommendation to take the gravely ill girl on an eight-hour trip to a high-tech hospital in England. Since she doesn't really know the country, the recommendation comes with a fleeting thought. What if her recommendation is wrong? I said, yes, we could end up in jail and, you know, because we've killed Pakistan's mother, Teresa. She is very precious to Pakistan and she's very precious to the rest of the world. And we were looking after her. From another Muslim country comes a life-giving offer. The Emir of the United Arab Emirates sends one of his royal planes outfitted as a hospital, a state-of-the-art intensive care unit. And for the entire eight-hour flight to England, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Kayani keep Malala alive, breath by breath, organ by organ. And they also have noticed something else that defies possibility. The bullet took a path that simply cannot be believed. The chances of being shot at point-blank range in the head and that happening, I don't know. But it is amazing, truly amazing. I, I don't know why she survived.
Maybe his hand was shaky. He hit her there. So it goes under the skin, near the skull? What, what happened? Yeah. yeah. A bullet traveling 1,000 feet per second slips under Malala's skin. But as it heads toward her brain, that bone turns out to be so strong and curved, it forces the bullet to ricochet away. Instead, the bullet smashes her eardrum, severs the nerve in her face, and hits her shoulder. The fact that she didn't die on the spot or very soon afterwards, and to my mind, is nothing short of miraculous. Miracle? If you believe in miracles, yes, absolutely. Maybe. It's the backbone and here's the brain, and God saved me. But even if she survives, at this point, doctors still have no idea if she'll ever walk or see or be able to speak again. Though somehow, in her deep coma, Malala says she remembers a kind of floating consciousness. She calls it her seven-day dream. I was thinking that, am I dead or am I alive? If I am dead, I shall be like in a graveyard. And then, but I said like, you are not dead. You can talk to yourself. How can you be dead? A vague sense that somehow she's at home and worried about being ready for school. I love my school and I loved my small house. At home in her paradise, which was SWAT. I think every second and every minute in SWAT was beautiful. It is a paradise. It's a paradise on earth. There are tall mountains and on the mountains there you can see green tall trees and in the in the center is is river that's called river swat and it's blue it's full of fish you would love the beauty of swat and that man with the gun on the school bus didn't grasp that the girl in the coma had a destiny carried in the name her father had given her at birth it is right out of the history books Malala, a girl from Maivand, a shepherd's daughter, led her people to victory when they were too afraid to fight. One Malala of Maivand is greater than thousands of men. So Malala rose up that if you don't speak up now, if you don't fight now, then you will be, then you will be cowards forever and then you would be slaves forever. We asked her father to sing the song of Malala he sang in her childhood. It says, your words can turn worlds around. Rise, Malala, rise again. Malale pasa, tapakla purta, stapa tapake, hum yava sarde, alta hum zamram, dalta hum zamram. Next, a miraculous recovery. While unable to speak, she turns to her diary. I have written, who did this to me? Why? Who shot me? And that yes. breakthrough moment when her shattered eardrum is repaired. And not only is her hearing restored. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> but her spirit. Diane Sawyer continues with this special edition of 2020. In a hospital in Birmingham, a 16-year-old girl is still fighting for her life. The doctors have no idea if she can move or see or express herself in any of the three languages she mastered fluently. She has been under deep medication and then one evening, a week after the shooting. And I just opened my eyes in a hospital in Birmingham. I didn't know where I was. She had this very frightened look uh, in her eyes, and her eyes were darting back and forth. She has tubes down her throat. So Dr. Kayani brings her an alphabet board. It is in English. And she points to letters. First the word country, and then the word father. She wanted to know where her father was. She wanted to know who was going to pay for the medical treatment. She was so worried about not being able to pay. Every day for several days, who was paying? And she actually believed the reason her father wasn't there was either he was dead, was one of the possibilities in her head, or that he was back in Pakistan selling everything they own for her medical treatment. Because the tube keeps her from speaking, Dr. Reynolds gives her a pink notebook so she can write her questions. And then on the same day I wrote, my father have no money. I told her that the Pakistan government was paying and she didn't believe me. 
The days pass in a blur of confusion, pain. She is seeing double. She can hear nothing from her left ear. And the left side of her face doesn't move. In the pink notebook, she is writing, scrambling the letters. But there's something she wants to know urgently. I have written, like, who did this, who did this to this me? To like, who did this to me? Why? Who shot me? And then what happened to me? I was asking Dr. Fiona. Dr. Reynolds will not give patients traumatic news when they're still under medication. She says they simply relive it over and over again. But eventually with Malala, she knows she has no choice. She was getting herself into a state, so I had to tell her the truth. And the truth was she'd been shot. She was asking me, was it a bomb? And I said, no, it was something bad. And she said, well, if it wasn't a bomb, what was it? So I said, you were shot. And she just looked at me. She didn't respond, she didn't react. She just looked at me. After a few moments, she said, it was the Taliban, wasn't it? And I said, I believe so, but I don't know for certain. She asks for a mirror, and the teenager who used to worry about her tiny stature, her difficult hair, now says she looked and thought her hair was so small. And I just looked at myself like this in the mirror, and then I just was thinking in my mind, like, the Taliban comes, they cut your hair, and then they shoot you. I thought they cut my hair. <laughs> I didn't know, like, the doctors did it for the surgery. In the pictures, you can see her face. The small dots are burns from the gunpowder. There are burns on her fingers, too. That's how close the gun was. You can see the black dots. She's incredibly stoical. She had to have some sutures uh, in her uh, wound in her scalp. And she also had to have a needle to drain some um, infected fluid from her neck. And on both occasions, she didn't wince, she didn't cry, she didn't even squeeze my hand when they were sticking needles into her. I didn't cry because now I totally changed after that incident. But I don't know how did I change. I don't know what happened to me. But I have to say, who, who can do this? Her. We all cry. I was feeling that this is a new life. But then, when her family enters the room, she falls apart. When we entered the room, half of her face left moves moved towards the right, and she lost her smile, her laughter. It will be the only time she breaks. When my father and mother came, it was the first time that I cried and I wept as much as I could. And it was a great moment for me. And once again, her champion is her father. Like this. She relearns to walk, unsteady, because her inner ear has been destroyed. Part of her skull has been replaced with a titanium plate. And because of that severed nerve, the laughter is gone. Her face won't move. So if you try and pout again for me, like that, and then say, egg, egg, oh egg, 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 egg. There's another surgery, eight and a half hours to try to reconnect the nerve on her face. She practices trying to smile every single day. Okay, so I'll switch it on. It takes a few seconds. And even though her eardrum is shattered forever, we're there when she gets the cutting-edge new technology, the cochlear implant. It's on. I'm going to say the days of the week. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and when I heard it, I was feeling very happy. And I said, like, Malala, you have heard something in your left ear, and now it's getting better. Her body is mending, but on the outside, everyone is wondering, what about her conviction? What about Malala's public voice? What do you see ahead for her now? I'm concerned that she's lost her ordinary life because she was a little girl from the Swat Valley who used to be able to play and have friends. And also she's been through so much. It was a very personal attack. And how do you cope with being targeted at the age of 15? At the same time, in a distant corner of the globe, the Taliban are still sending messages, death threats, hatred. I think life is always dangerous. Some people get afraid of it, some people don't go forward. But some people, if they want to achieve their goal, they have to go. And the courage is still there. It's, it's, it's telling me to move forward. She tells me she's decided death was just not ready for her yet. I think... Death didn't want to kill me, and God was with me, 
and the people prayed for me. And the people who had prayed for her, the people who had wondered about her, got their answer about her on her 16th birthday. There, at the United Nations, gathered in the hall dignitaries and children from around the world. Her father was there, and so was her mother, who for the first time let herself appear on camera. And walking up to the podium, it was the power of Malala again. I am the same Malala. I was thinking, is this the same daughter who was once almost killed? She's standing in UN, speaking to the whole world, and she's holding the flag of hope, the flag of peace. I was very proud. Let us pick up our books and our pens. They are our most powerful weapons. Education is the only solution. Education first. Thank you. Next, in search of answers, other voices on Malala. I think she's not wise. I think she's a propaganda for the media. Coming up. We continue now with Diane Sawyer and Malala. Tonight in a changing world, Behind a girl named Malala are hundreds of millions of people, including Muslims, seeking a future and a full education for their children. Tonight, a million children have signed a petition only with their thumbprints because they can't write. And the government of Pakistan just this year voted to make education compulsory for every child in that country. And remember, worldwide, there are more than a billion Muslims. 1% in the shadows. The 1% who are dangerous, implacable when it comes to the education of women. We asked Nicholas Kristoff of the New York Times, an advocate on women and children, why? There is this perception that they are under assault and particularly the notion of honor of their women is kind of emblematic of that. And they see girls' education as a road toward uh, women controlling their fertility and having fewer children, listening less to their husband, wanting to go work, kind of symbolizing the end of that way of life. Ranyad Libby writes about modern Muslims in the world. An empowered woman is one that cannot be controlled. Anyone who puts a bullet through a 12-year-old's head is evil. Such criminal, evil behavior doesn't deserve a rational explanation. Through the decades, I have traveled the world, hey, what's your... AK yeah, including Kabul, just after the Taliban arrived. And it's always confounding that the hardliners are not just men, but women who also fight change. For this broadcast, we travel to the Red Mosque in Islamabad, where 3,000 girls are in school there but learning through the hardline lens of their Muslim teachers. The headmistress says some of these girls once came in with questions too, just the kind Malala had. They have some arguments with us, but then we talk to them and explain things to them. And some of the girls from this school back in 2007 covered themselves in what is called the niqab and took to the streets with whips to punish people for not following Sharia law. We're going to sit down, I yeah. think it's easier. Well, back in England, we traveled one dark evening to meet with a group of extreme hardline fundamentalists there. I sat with the women to try to comprehend why they oppose a full education of the kind girls get in the West. What are girls learning that is wrong? Freedom and democracy, obviously, is not from Islam. It totally is the opposite. Freedom and democracy and Islam cannot coexist. Is either there's Islam or there's non-Islam. Either you're Muslim or you are non-Muslim. That you could, there's no in between. They told me they choose to wear the covering, the niqab. It's a kind of guard against the corruption of women in the West. A woman is seen as no more than a sex object in society. Her contribution to society depends on how much cleavage she shows or how much leg she shows. The Islamic teaching teaches us to guard our honor 
guard our chastity, to you know, protect ourselves. And when you see someone completely uncovered like me, what do you think? Oppressed. No, I, I oppressed. oppressed because you are not subservient to the one who created you. Rather, you are subservient, you are slave to your own desires. If you were not Diane Sawyer, famous Diane Sawyer, and had not achieved you know, what you've achieved in your life, would you have been happy being a mother? And you think it's possible to have both? In the Western side, the women, mm -hmm. all they're trying to do is achieve what men are achieving. They're trying to have babies and then go to work and still be a size zero. This, it's just so, it's so difficult being a woman in the Western world. I'm so glad I'm not in the Western world. It's so difficult being a woman in the Western world. But tonight, Nihad Awad, US director of an American Muslim organization, says if there is a battle for the soul of Islam, good Muslims like a girl named Malala will win. To me, uh, she represents what Islamic values uh, are. She's bigger than all of them because she embodies Islamic values of seeking knowledge, standing up for justice. If the Taliban believe in God, they should know that God said the killing of an innocent person is the equivalence of the killing of the entire humanity. You have this teenage girl who's been willing to speak up dramatically for a change, even when she got letters from the Taliban warning her not to, even after she was shot. It's a reminder that at times we can find leadership in the most unexpected quarters. The greatest threat to the Taliban is not American drones, it's girls like Malala. And we want you to know that in coming weeks on World News, we're going to look more deeply at the complex history, the fierce arguments of the radical minority in Islam, and what could possibly make that change. We'll be right back. Next, you have heard what the fundamentalists say. When we come back, what Malala has to say about education, women, family, lots of children. I'll decide it later. And the startling things about where she's living today. Unbreakable continues. Once again, Diane Sawyer. In this past year, so many people have been rising up to help with the education of young girls, and you can be part of it too. You may have seen online all the people raising their hands to say, I am Malala. And Malala's own organization is called the Malala Fund, helping young girls out of a life with no future into a life of their dreams. Tonight, the Malala Fund is hard at work, trying to educate, empower girls around the world. While Malala herself answers the voices who speak against her. It's their right to speak. And now it's my right to speak. It's their right to speak against me. And it's their right. But the thing is, I only want support for my cause of education. It's the right of every girl and every boy. The kind of education you were getting, they argue, is a Western education. If I want to go to school and I want to become a doctor, so there would be an Eastern doctor or a Western doctor. Is there a difference in the studies? If I want to become, a, become an engineer, so is there a different way to become an engineer, Eastern engineer or a Western engineer? This is education, this is knowledge. It can neither be Eastern nor Western. She also surprised us when we asked about those who shot her. The only person arrested was a chemistry student named Atula Khan, but he was released right after arrest. Malala says, real Islam teaches you must forgive. So. As of tonight, no one has been arrested or prosecuted for what they did to you. It's not important if they are prosecuted or arrested. But isn't it important that the, that the girls of Pakistan know that someone will be prosecuted for doing this? <laughs> he would have a family, he would have mother, he would have sister, and her mother would, be, her mother would love him as a son. And I think I'm not a cruel person. I want to fight with them. I want to fight against them. But through my voice and through my pen and through my book and through my love and through my brotherhood, not with guns. Are you in any pain anymore? 
I know now I have no pain. I'm very well and I'm recovered now, totally recovered. The doctors are still working uh, on my physiotherapy and still thinking about the left side of my face and also thinking about my jaw. But that's just a small thing. I'm recovered. <laughs> Smile is here. Yeah. Do you think she'll change the world? I hope so. I think she's got the potential to. She and her family now live in England. She attends a girls' school, loves her studies, and her cricket. Yes! But still lives on a kind of border between two worlds. Do you believe in covering your head? Yes, this is my culture. This is my own choice that I'm doing this. It's not been implemented on me. I'm thinking of you walking through a mall. <laughs> it's totally different. We have never seen like women in short uh, dresses, so that's something like new and difficult for my mother. Her traditionalist mother, who is finally learning to read, though she looks at Western girls and proclaims, "I'm going to mispronounce this, Gorja Shama." No, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Roughly translated, it means um, shocking. And the other thing is that um, my mother is very worried about the waste of food. In our country, uh, there are so many poor people. We used to give food to those poor people. But now she says, like, if there is no one, let me give it to the birds. And though no one doubts, this is a girl who plans to lead the world. In America! People are waiting for a woman president. I want to be a politician, but uh, I haven't decided what job would I do. Try to ask her about family, and you find a shy girl from a shy culture. Family, lots of children? <laughs> um, I don't know what would I do in future. I'll decide it later. <laughs> <laughs> none of my business. Um, you can say none of your business. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and for all her gratitude at her new life, there's a kind of loneliness and longing. Some people say, I will never turn home, but I believe in my heart that I will. She tells us she's been reading a book, The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. Yes, there's no place like home, and I believe it. If you go anywhere, you went to the paradise, you would miss your home, and I do miss my home. Before she was shot, she planted a mango tree behind her house in the Swat Valley, hoping the mango would grow. I just planted it in the middle of the garden, and I wanted to see a big mango tree, and that we would sit under it, under its shade. And I was thinking about my future. Do you know if it's alive? Do you know if it's still growing? I don't know.